As you know, today's presentation is a, uh, is a candidate forum for the uh, District 3 and District 5 County Commissioners. First question is going to come from the President, and that's why it's good to be President. So the first question is, and I'm going to frame this first uh, before you answer it. As you are aware, the City of Vera Beach is an unregulated price monopoly for its electric utility, whose, whose customers pay 30% more than FPL. This costs our community $21 million a year in excessive rates. 20,000 of the 33,000 customers of the electric system live outside the city, and they pay 30% more than FPL. They contribute to the city's general fund. They have no representation. And worse, they are part of a territory that the city believes is permanent and without subject to review. These are customers who are subject to taxation without representation. Of course, FPL, the sale to FPL would relieve all of those problems, but the single largest impediment to the sale is a government bureaucracy known as the FMPA. Here is the question If the FMPA obstructs the sale of the City of Riverbridge Electric System to FPL, what will you do? to defend the 20,000 customers outside of the City of Vera Beach from the FMPA and the City of Vera Beach. Did you hear the question correctly? What will you do if the FMPA obstructs a sale to FPNL, and what will you do to defend the 20,000 customers who live outside the City of Vera Beach? I'm very happy that I have to say that I've been very engaged in this issue for a number of years. And the county commission has already started what it will do. There are some laws on the books which may have to be changed, but we're beginning by having a survey, which will probably take place next January, of all the customers who live outside the city service area. And we're going to take the results of that survey, which I believe will be overwhelmingly positive, to get out of the yoke of the, the city's slavery and actually free them to make their own choices. And that will be the first step. The next step will be to engage the FPA, FMPA in any way we have to and let them know that we're not going to rest until the right thing is done for those customers. That may involve going up to Tallahassee and changing some laws, or they just may, when they see hopefully the writing on the wall, do the right thing and allow Vero to get out of its FMPA certitude, servitude and allow us then to function as a community the way we should. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, anybody that's been watching this issue knows that as a member of the City Council, I started this ball rolling and voted in favor of inviting FPL to the table. The, uh, I, I would disagree with your president about the 20,000 because uh, it's 33,000 customers that are county residents. It's not just the 20,000 outside the city that need help. We all need help, and those of us in the city too. And um, Glenn also knows that uh, I've taken an active role in trying to get uh, FMPA out of our hair, and I've also uh, extended my involvement into other cities outside of, the, uh, outside of our service area to help them, because I think that one of the things that we're going to need in order to have FMPA get out of our hair is to uh, is to have the involvement of other cities so that we can uh, we can join together in, a, in an effort to try to uh, probably the, the the best answer is to disband FMPA um, probably what we need is someone on the uh, city council that will go to the uh, FM next FMPA meeting and say I make a motion for dissolution I'm just more comfortable saying if I may um, I, uh, do I need to? Yes, I'll follow it. It's a complicated question. Uh, and if we begin with the premise that um, people are being abused by the present system, I think that gives rise to Glenn's uh, uh, characterizing the question is what do we do to defend those people? I get that the people outside of the county are paying more, I get that they're subsidizing the city of Vero. I hope that it is that injustice is not a catalyst for 
a bunch of infighting and a bunch of misery. I will do all I can to make everyone happy with this. Glenn and I sat very briefly at lunch a couple weeks ago. One thing that I haven't heard bandied about, and uh, I happen to be an attorney by trade, when you talk about dissolving a contractual obligation, one thing that happens, you'll understand this if you've ever had a lease on a house. If you say, I'll be there for 12 months, and your situation changes, and you can only be there for six months, you break the lease. You don't want to break the lease. You agree, to, uh, agree. but one thing that happens when you break that lease, you don't just owe all the money automatically under the lease. The counterparty, in this case F FFPA, has a duty to mitigate. We were, Nick, fine. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, I'll try my best. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great question, Glenn. Uh, the first thing I would do is go right up to Governor Rick Scott and ask him to disband the FMPA under uh, the guidelines that it's not serving the needs of the residents of the utility system or the, the customers of the utility system in a fair and equitable manner. Um, I've talked with a number of the members of the that are very familiar with the electric uh, issue and I'm uh, working on putting together a trip to Tallahassee to meet with Governor Scott to bring these points to him to show him that these high electric costs is a large job deterrent to those people seeking to locate inside the enterprise zone. Thank you. I agree with what everybody has said here. It, it is important to support this. Uh, if you go and look at all the, all the uh, costs that people are paying in businesses that are outside the county, I myself, I live outside the county, I work outside the county, and the 30% above what they should be paying, where that money could go, I can tell you right now, the hospital will probably save over $300,000 a year when FPNL comes online, and same with Piper and everyone else. But I agree we have to take an active role. I agree we have to work for the county residents and the city residents as a group. And uh, we, we need to work together to make this uh, make this happen. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going to come out of this. Uh, taxing of the of the power lines. We're going to get a tax base out of it. Uh, a lot of positive things that we need to educate the public about so we can gain their support. In addition, like Tim said, of getting the government to to step in and help us. Thank you. I guess how much time do we have? One minute. One minute cannot even begin to answer this question, Glenn, but it was a good question. Now your question was, how can the county commissioners make this right? There are, other, there are a lot of things they can do, but I, I dealt with this issue four years ago, and I felt that the first thing that needed to be done to try to make the rates a little more equal was to do away with the 6% franchise fee. I met with Joe Baird and Jason Brown four years ago, I asked him why we charged it. He says, because we can. That's $3 million a year that the city collects in franchise fees, collects on their own, on their bill, and turn it right back over to the county. We could do away with that, and we could keep our eyes and ears open for some form of an alternative if the sale doesn't go through, such as partial sale, other options are out there. We've not heard any of this yet. I believe that the commissioners need to live, listen to all of the options before they can determine what area they're going to help their county residents alleviate from this bill. Thank you. That may generate some other questions if you want to pass them forward to Alice, and I'll uh, get to those. The next question from the audience is, what specifically, I want something specific, what will you do to reduce taxes in Indian River County? I want a specific example. Maybe we'll start with you. Reducing taxes is something that's probably never going to happen in our lifetime again, but what I would consider highly as a county commissioner is not to raise taxes. I wish I could say I could. I might, I might be able to reduce taxes by not raising a gas tax. I'm not sure if you're aware of the fact that that's been on the back burner for a while. It is my opinion that reducing a tax is pretty much on the way with the values of our properties. Our taxes have been reduced and I would hope that our taxes will go up if property goes up. So in a long shot, the only way I can think of it is just to maintain the taxes the way they are. Thank you. 
I have to say that uh, the cuts that the county have done to date have been very fiscal and responsible. And those, cu those cuts every year add up. So every year those cuts are adding up to the budget. So it's not whether we continue to cut, because I know there's, it's hard once you get to this point of, of cutting any further, but we'd have to look closely where exactly, I, I, you know, I agree, it's hard, it's hard to say exactly where we need to do that, but it's about keeping taxes where there are. I think it's more important of being more fiscally responsible of how we use the taxes more wisely to, uh, uh, for our taxpayers of Indian River County. And uh, it's going to be a tough job with what has already been cut to date. Thank you. Yes, one initiative I'd like to put in is how many other county departments can be run as an enterprise, as an enterprise fund? As many of you are aware, or maybe not, there's three enterprise funds that operate within the county government umbrella. They are the building department, the golf course, and the utilities department. If you look at the healthy utilities department, it's pretty healthy. If you look at the golf course, it's self-sustaining through playing fees, greens fees, and, and uh, other such revenue streams that they have. Uh, thirdly, the best example is to look at the building department enterprise fund. It has gone from a peak of 44 employees during the boom time down to 14. It, it truly goes up and down as the economic demand is there. It operates with a cash surplus of approximately uh, three and a half million dollars. There is no cost to the taxpayer. They own their own space within the building. They pay a pro rata share of GNA expenses to the county. And it's the best way to run a county department to make it accountable and fiscally responsible. Thank you. I think I would, uh, I'm glad to hear my, um, my colleagues up here say what I generally feel, which is that we've made a lot of progress in this county. I don't think any individual commissioner can take credit for the fact that the economy's just been awful for the last four years and our tax receipts have gone way down. I stand with B when I say, I want morale around this county to come up. I think the days of cutting and cutting and cutting have left a very uh, bitter taste in a lot of people's mouth. And if we can um, hold the line on millage, but, um, but look forward to more revenue, I think we can, can get the spirit back in, in, in this county and uh, get away from just cut, cut, cut. Um, if I had more time to answer, which I don't, um, I would talk about you know my penny wise, pound foolish. I think that we spent a lot of time, and commissioners spent a lot of time talking about little things when uh, we are giving away money in big chunks. And I would talk, I'd look forward to talking about that more. To be specific, Mr. President, the uh, stop spending tax dollars on non-governmental purposes. And it's really just as simple as that. Government needs to stop being Robin Hood and stealing from the poor taxpayers to give to those uh, some very rich entities, uh, specifically uh, in today's newspaper, Sports Village. Uh, they took 2.6 million of your dollars and gave to Sports Village. And I just don't think that that's a governmental purpose. The, uh, the dumping of millions of dollars every year up on the beach, only to have it disappear in the next storm. It's not a governmental purpose. They need to stop spending those kinds of, of tax dollars, and it's millions and millions of dollars. And um, the um, uh, buying of development rights, another example. And $20 million, we spent over $20 million to buy development rights, uh, these, these kinds of expenditures. And the only way to cut taxes, the only way to cut taxes is to cut expenditures. You have to stop your spending as a governing authority. Uh, we have reduced taxes. Our ad valorem tax tape has gone down from $100 million to $70 million. That's one of the greatest reductions probably in America. And how specifically to reduce that further, because we can? Well, a month ago, I did a little thing and pushed the cut of the commissioner's car allowance in half from $4,200 a year to $2,100 a year. $10,500, small but meaningful. And going on in the second term, I led the way to cut 13 county committees. I would like now to go and work with the state to cut committees which the state mandates we have, but which are unnecessary. And I'd also like to further work further to cut regulation, especially regulations imposed on us by the state. That's the next level of cuts. And I believe we can see significant cuts if we can get the legislature to work with us and do the right thing for the citizens of Indian River County. Thank you. Thank you.
Next question. And I, I'm assuming this relates to what happened in Wisconsin recently uh, with collective bargaining. What is your position on collective bargaining as it relates to government employees? What is your position on collective bargaining as it relates to government employees? Tony? I don't know too much about uh, collective bargaining, so I really I don't know if I can answer that well. Uh, it's okay. I'm not, uh, I don't think at this point I have enough information to answer that, but uh, I would have to pass on that one. And get more information and get back to you on that. Go this way. Yep. Okay. On collective bargaining, I think the word bargaining is the key word, is to bargain harder on the, on the side of the taxpayer. We want to be fair, we want to pay reasonable competitive rates to our public servants, especially our law enforcement people. Um, the current, right now all contracts are current. The next contract that comes up uh, with the union is the International Firefighters Association, which starts in early 2013. That's the first one. Uh, the recent contract negotiations approximately three years ago yielded a number of cost-saving uh, features that were added, but there's still a lot of room to go, especially how vacation and sick pay cash outs are accumulated and tracked within the accounting system. The county needs a little bit more current system so it can pay earned values versus retirement values at the end of their career. Thank you. Uh, I'm probably with Tony. It's not something, I'm a Floridian. We're just not very familiar with unions down here. Um, my understanding um, is that the unions that we work with, the Teamsters, the PBA, are um, generally quite a bit easier to get along with than, than the northern style hardcore um, unions that demand, make a lot of demands. Um, I, because I tend to group, for instance, the uh, PBA, and this is a little difficult, con convoluted for me to say, police occupy a position of trust. And I would love it if it were true that the, when we come to the police with a problem, we have a budgetary problem, I want them to solve the problem. I don't want it to be a fight. I want them to understand they're part of this community. We tell them what needs done. They work it out among themselves, and they come back and deal with us. If they're unwilling or unable to do that, then we take other steps. Uh, I am uh, looking forward to engaging with them, and I think we can be constructive. I uh, <coughs> need to put up a shield first here to make sure that some rocks don't get thrown at me. But uh, unions aren't the problem. Unions aren't the enemy. Government workers aren't the problem. Government workers aren't the enemy. And I'll tell you, it gets, it, it gets discouraging. Nick uh, talked a little while ago about the, uh, the employees and how discouraged they are. They're not the enemy. The only reason a union even exists is because of a bad employer. We take $10 million and dump it on the sand and then we want to get rid of the, the, the lifeguards? Or get rid of some of the police? Huh? Government workers are entitled to and we should be ready, willing, able, and happy to pay those government workers a decent living wage. It's not the government workers that are causing the high taxes in our country. It's hand up, time to stop. I'd like to begin acknowledging the fact that collective bargaining, the, the Supreme Court of Florida has found, is a constitutional right. So I think that's important to understand. I also agree with most of the others that we have no collective bargaining problem in Florida, or at least in any river county, like they've had in Wisconsin. Our employees are great employees. They've held the line for the last three years. And if there's any problem over time with collective bargaining, it's with weak-willed elected officials who take their eye off the ball. If we keep our eye on the ball of limited government and do things like the county has and transfer a number of government jobs which were not related to essential services into the private sector, then we will shrink the number of county workers, which we have done by almost 25%, leave a manageable number of county workers to do and perform the essential services 
and maintain very good working relationships with them. Thank you. I wrote the question down because I knew it would be a long time before I got the microphone. The question was, uh, what would be my position on collective bargaining as it relates to employees? Number one, our employees were hired to use it and not lose it. And I believe that that's something we have to keep in mind when we're moving on and we know already that we cannot sustain ourselves. I don't care if it's a business or a government or a car manufacturer like GMAC. You cannot sustain yourself when you're paying out more to retired people that aren't putting into the system. We need to get this under control. It is being worked out with the city. The county's already done some effort in this area, but I do believe we need to continue to remember that we should grandfather in the ones that are already there. I don't want to take anything away from anybody that was hired in knowing that this was what they were going to have. But that's then, and this is now, and we must get this under control. Thank you, candidates. I have a related question here uh, from the floor, and I'll try to phrase it in, in the relation to the last question. How do you view the concept of, invest, of the county investing our tax dollars, investing in private businesses? And, and maybe a way to answer this is, what do you view as the role of government as it relates to public versus private sector activities? And we will start, did everybody, did everybody get that question? I'll, I'll rephrase it. How do you view the concept of the county investing our tax dollars, investing in private business? And I think that's more of a question about the relationship between what is the role of government in, in relationship to public and private sector activities. Tim, we will start with you. Sure. If I understand the question correctly, this would be the incentives that are given to existing businesses for job grants or job creation to existing or new businesses. Um, it's a provision to remain uh, competitive. If you go back a number of years when Reed Knight had the opportunity to triple the expansion of his business, I think quadruple his employment staff here in New River County, he looked at the rules and regulations, the incentive packages, and in a very short period of time made the decision to move to the county to the north in Brevard. And Brevard now has, I believe, the 320 plus jobs that Knight Armament has. Um, so we have to look, we have to remain competitive. We can't be crazy and foolish. But if we want to see our homegrown industries move away to people that offer that, we have to figure out a way to be competitive in the overall scoring of businesses existing and looking to move to the county. Thank you. I'm generally against using county taxpayer funds to invest in jobs. I think I've already said two or three times uh, about my uh, opposition to taking your tax dollars and handing it over to private business. I mean, I, I just absolutely opposed to that. But should government invest in private business? And the answer is yes. And now have I totally lost my mind, Blaine? No. Should they invest in private business? Yeah. And you know, how should they invest in private business? Buy locally. And that, that provision's been before our governing bodies. Now, well, if we're going to spend some of our tax dollars, we need something, uh, you know, we need a contractor to come in and, and fix the lights or build a new building. Buy locally. Do it with local contractors. And I brought that up when I was on city council. Bob voted against it as a county commissioner. We need to invest in our companies by buying from our taxpayers. I believe we've got a very good economic development program going right now. And we have a tax abatement program, which you, the voters, voted for. We have a jobs credit program, which works. Three, year, three years ago, before we changed it, we had one applicant in three years. Since changing it, we've had about 12 applicants, which are bringing jobs to Indian River County. I don't believe we ought to pick out individual companies and make special provisions for them. And I voted against that both with Enios when they wanted a special rate at the landfill, voted against it when somebody wanted to change the terms of a job credit, and it turned out that that then blew up, so that turned out to be a good vote. And I'll continue for voting against special privileges for individual companies, but I believe that the platform we have for bringing businesses into the community today 
is a very good platform which has started to work and will continue to work over the next years. Thank you. Again, we're talking about what can government do for private business as opposed to putting their two cents worth into financing a business. Now we have a chamber and we have a tourist council and we have all kinds of things and enterprise zones put in place to help businesses when they're interested in coming to be, and we need businesses here, good businesses for the taxpayers. However, I resent when a community gets all up in arms for months, years, and supports a company like Piper, and then I hear, very recently I heard a speech that Piper was doing very well, then why isn't our commission getting us our money back from Piper? That's the kind of thing I would like to see happen. If we're going to help a business and we've cut a deal with that business, and they owe us money on an incremental basis to pay us back, let's get the money back. I think, the, excuse me, <clears throat> I think the role of government is economic development. I mean, that, that's what our role is. I think if we're, by the comprehensive plan, it's got to be issued. Uh, it's not about raising taxes to, to invest in the companies. It's about the incentives. The incentives that would bring people here, not the taxes, uh, or what we give to them as far as uh, using tax dollars or raising tax dollars to do that. Uh, the tax abatement, the, uh, the, the job grants, the enterprise zone, those are things that we need to protect in order to bring companies here and, and create jobs. Uh, it's about creating jobs. It's also, create, it's also about looking at what the county invests into the community and what we're getting back as far as tax base, as far as creating jobs for people that are out of work. Uh, and, th and that's why I, I think it's important that we, we need to help businesses come here to create the tax base, to create jobs, uh, and, and to maintain maintain businesses like uh, Nine Arm Armament that was here and other companies that come. Uh, thank you. It's one o'clock, how is everyone doing? Everyone enjoying themselves? Good, because I'd, like I'd like to keep it going for a little while longer. Uh, here's a question for you from the audience. How would you handle the problem of beach erosion and it says, i.e., core of engineers. Uh, maybe the question should be, what's your position on sand pumping? Is, this, is, it a, should, is it a project we should support or perhaps not support? And Nick? I have this conversation all the time with old buddies that I grew up here. I mean, I was, uh, I recall at, I believe, 10 years old, my church um, going over to the Ocean Grill and filling sandbags because the uh, a hurricane or a tropical, a big nor'easter was coming by. Just from a personal emotional basis, I don't know that we've experienced dramatic erosion. I know that we've uh, dumped sand. I know that it. Um, uh, I catch fewer snook at Rio Mar Reef than I used to, and I can't help but wonder whether uh, any replacement sand goes in and kills the reefs. I think it probably does. Um, I would have to study it. I think there, uh, I have engineer friends who've sat around, who've chatted about it, chatted about it. I think there are alternatives to um, mining, and I think there are alternatives to pumping. Uh, and just to not be coy about it, I think there are ways to use the waves themselves, which are a natural transport mechanism for sand, to, uh, to help us deposit uh, sand on the beach. So we could make the beach more receptive to natural systems. That's um, my thinking going in. Sand disappears after we dump, on, dump it on the beach. The sand disappears, and now I know where it went to. Nick and his family have taken and filled sandbags, and they've taken them off the beach to protect the house. Sorry about that. Oh, I meant I said the ocean Anyway, no, the, uh, you know, it, it, it does disappear. I mean, you had. If you live in this community and, and you watch them dump the sand on and then watch it disappear, uh, it's, it's not working, kids. But there are things that have worked. The pet weed has, has worked. So if that works, then rather than just throw your dollars away constantly, why don't we, why don't we look for something that does work? Uh, there's a huge contingency of uh, Zork family down here, and Frank Zork uh, famously, you know, he calls it dollar dumping. 
it is dollar dumping. And we need to find a better way. We need to stop just throwing your tax dollars into the ocean. I think the good news for Vero Beach is that we still have a beach. And if we had done nothing, we probably wouldn't have one. So I'm in favor, and I believe we always must do something to protect our beaches. But the Board of County Commissioners, after the completion of the last project, has already put in place a program to try to figure out what the best way going forward is. I don't know. I'm not a sand expert, and I'm not a beach expert. But we are making sure that we look at the best technology which is available for our community from anywhere in the country and the world, and we will try to do our best when it comes before us as a commission to make the best, most cost-effective choice. But at the end of the day, I'll make it clear, I am for protecting our beaches. Thank you. What's the biggest asset you have? It's your home, right? <clears throat> the beach is our biggest asset. There's no question about it. We live in Vero Beach. Indian River County has beaches all over the county from the south end to the north end. We would be lost with our beaches. That's what we're all about. So if you have an asset, you need to protect it. If you had a roof leak, what would you do? You would fix it. If the area that you tried to fix didn't work and you still had a leak, you'd go ahead and try to fix it in another way. I believe as long as the beaches are our biggest asset, we, I agree with what Bob, Bob Solari just said. We have to do everything we can to protect it, and the government is doing that. I, I agree with B and Bob. The, the question is the, the asset. The beach, just like the Inner River Lagoon, is, is important to, uh, to our community, to our businesses, to the tourists that come here. Uh, Beach erosion, I think one third comes from the state because of the turtles. I think a third comes from uh, tourist development tax. And the other third is responsibility to maintain an infrastructure that we do have. Uh, and I think it's important that, that we uh, keep that in mind. Uh, and, and as far as uh, pumping sand, I, I agree. It's, it's, you're wasting time to bring it in because it's going back out. I think we need to look at better ways of controlling the erosion. And I think the county is looking into that. We, we need to look into it further. Uh, thank you. Yes, the, the beach is one of our largest assets. Uh, we need to maintain a very usable and friendly beach. If not, the tourists won't come here to bring the tourist dollars, which has a domino effect in the local businesses. But if you, I think you have to look at why, why do we have such large beach erosion here? And you look at South Beach at 17th Street uh, Park area, and you have a growing beach. Well, you take one aerial photograph from the Sebastian Inlet South, and you'll see all the sand that is supposed to be deposited on the Con Beach area and those properties south of Sewa Basso is compiling on the north side of the inlet. And as the currents bring it down, it skips the adjoining area directly south of the inlet all the way down, and it deposits itself down on South Beach. So you have a growing beach in one area and a receding beach in another. So I think we need to look at the big picture solution of how we work with the inlet district and in working on having them be part of the solution and the funding source to maintain and get the sand that's where it should be where it's compiling thank you thank you everyone what you probably notice is i've been asking general questions where everybody can uh, uh, participate and, and get their one minute of response in uh, this is not my question by the way this came from the floor uh, this one is, are you in favor of selling Vero Beach Electric if it can be accomplished? And I think the way to, to answer this one is we'll just do a show of hands. Are you in favor of, not quite yet, <laughs> are you in, there'll be three choices. Are you in favor of, of the sale to FPL and doing all that it takes to accomplish that? Do you want to, after four years, this is option number two, continue to study the problem? Or are you absolutely opposed to the sale? Would be the third option. So, show of hands for the first option. Are you in favor? And doing all that it takes. Brian, you're kind of hedging there. Well, I mean, you, I didn't you, ask. You, no, I didn't ask for. Didn't ask for a speech. I just want just. It, 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 yeah, yes or no? <laughs> show of hands, please. All those in favor. All those opposed. Say that again. All those opposed. All those who want to study the problem. Please. I'm a D. I'm a fair pricer. 
We, it's an impossible decision to make unless we know the economic terms. That's right. Fair price. Yeah, if, you guys want to have a minute to speak about it? Go ahead. Let's start. One minute. Brian? If, if the uh, OUC and the FNPA uh, penalties are $200 million so that the taxpayers have to dip into their pocket for $100 million, do, do I want to sell it? Of course not. I think the reality is that the deal that FPL will put together and, and eventually bring forward will do a couple of things that are important to me. It's going to give the uh, current electric employees employment will stay on the payroll that's important to me and it's going to save the community 20 million dollars that's important to me i believe that kind of a deal is going to be on the table but to say blanketly you know it sell under any circumstances i can't i can't say yes to that i didn't say that and yes, she did yes, no. she did yes, she did the question was the question was are you in favor of the sale and doing all that it takes to do that you sale? Said to i didn't yeah. say I didn't say sell at any price. Well, how is that different? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm an English major. That sounds almost identical to me as far as, as far as the proposition. And Bob's hand goes up, which is sell at any price. Do whatever it takes to sell. I'm certainly not that guy. Um, we have our own electric system because Vero Beach, in a large, large way, predated Indian River County. We, you know, historic, this is a matter of, uh, of our history. If we were to build this town from scratch, I think everybody agrees we'd probably sign up with FPL to provide our uh, energy, but that's just not the facts on the ground right now. Yes, I think um, what people forget when they see the purchase price offered by FPL is what's included in the price that FPL is paying: the dismantling of the plant, a multi-million-dollar expense, unfunded pension obligations and retirement obligations on the city municipal electric employees a multi 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 million dollar obligation that they will pick up the tab for when those employees transfer from the city of Grove Beach utilities to fpnl so you when you only see the purchase price you need to look at the contract and get your adding machine out and add what's added to the contract to get to a real value of what fpnl is paying thank you 20 million dollars a year is a lot of money and just briefly in talking about what the savings is Another thing that can happen that we're not happening in, in uh, the city of Vero Beach is ice storage. We do a lot of ice storage for schools and rebates can be up to $800,000 from FPNL for that because that takes, that takes them off peak hours. So the, the businesses that are in the county, like the, the hospital and Piper and, and even the county itself, can go in and put these systems in and get a rebate and also save money on electricity more than the 20 million that we're going to save so it's about it's about the offshoot the life cycle what we're going to put into it now what it's going to save every year from here on out getting a tax base out of the power lines uh, you know, all of that we, we got to look at the bottom line there is a value there's an asset to what we own or what city River beach owns as far as that power and i don't think that asset there's been a value put to that i think they want to keep it themselves and then we need to we need to approach that and look at that and look at the net value thank you Right now, all we are in this whole issue of pundits, we can all talk about it from every point of view that we can think of for hours, because gosh knows it's been in the newspaper. So rather than be a pundit, why don't we just say it like it is? It is in good hands. The city has high-priced attorneys taking care of as much as they can to the tune of millions of dollars just to get out of sale. Give them a time to find out. The only thing that I would ask, and I wish I had, I've asked this all along, I think that we have always needed to have a fair price for that system, and not only a fair price, we need to know uh, what, it, what it's going to take to get out of those contracts, and I wish the heck they would have done that first so we know where we're at. I think sometimes attitude is everything. And if you go into this with the attitude that you can't get out of it, then you won't. We can get out of it. This, in the scope of America, is a very small deal. Every day in America, we do build business of, or buyouts of 10 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion dollars. We, if we say we can accomplish this, we will. And if the FMPA does the right thing by Vero Beach, we will come out better than whole. 
if FMPA decides it doesn't want to do the right thing for the city of Vero Beach, then I am ready to fight the political fight, if that means going up to Tallahassee or wherever the MP is going, but we can get out. And if you have the right attitude, you're gonna get out of it with the city of Vero Beach coming out very, very well. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm kind of done with the general questions. So for the next 10 minutes, and there are a couple of questions that we had here that were very specific candidate related questions, and I'd rather not ask those, I'd rather have the floor ask those. So for the next 10 minutes, let's do uh, some questions from the floor, and then the last uh, five minutes, uh, we'll do a wrap up with the uh, candidates, and uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. So let's start with some questions from the floor. No, you got one. Charles, go ahead. To each candidate, what is your opinion on um, impact fees and what, for what purpose should those impact fees be used? Yeah, I've got a perfectly clear record on this. I believe that impact fees ought to be used to pay for, for development and the impact that development causes. It ought not to be used for economic development purposes or any other purposes. Right now, I believe that we should have in place all the impact fees we have by statute, but without the ones we're not charging, the three or four we're not charging right now, and I believe we should be charging for them. And I believe that the amount of the impact fees right now is fine. It should not be any higher. And we've been told that with commercial impact fees that we cannot lower them if we don't lower residential impact fees, but I believe we need to find a little better way so that we can reduce commercial impact fees which don't actually cause the impact to our community and keep residential impact fees where they are. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. The uh, impact fees, Charlie, are categorical. You know all about categorical. You got stuck in that kind of a quagmire uh, when you were on the school board and you would have loved, I'm sure, to take some money and move it out and do a better purpose and, and you knew of better purposes. but impact fees are categorical you don't have a lot of choice you must spend them for the purpose that they were collected the um, in terms of the amount of impact fees I think that we probably really need to do a recheck of the formulas that are used and I think the impact fees are too high I'm with Bob on this one I think he stated perfectly which is um, a year ago and um, and I'll look at it more closely when I'm on the commission, but uh, right now, if my position is pay as you go, concurrency, let's do it. Um, impact fees, as being a home builder, I paid my impact fees a lot over the years, but there's two parts that people may not understand. One ties back to the city of Real Beach Power. That's a huge economic deterrent if you're a commercial user on electric. Uh, the city of Real Beach electric impact fee can easily run into a six-figure number, staggering and stopping many potential economic development projects within the county. Most people aren't aware that the recent expansion of the Vero Beach Museum of Art, their 9,000 square foot vault storage building has an electric impact fee of $114,000. $114,000 to an unregulated industry through the city of Vero Beach Power. That is a crime. So, uh, but back to the main part of impact fees, uh, six, half of the 67 counties in Florida now have zero or significantly reduced impact fees for both residential and business. That was brought to our attention at the recent Economic Development Committee meeting. And I think we have to look at, again, how do we become competitive to other counties if, if Duval and, and Flagler have no impact fees and the business wants to come here and it's gonna cost them a half a million dollars extra, where do you think they might go? Thank you. We need to maintain impact fees. I think what Tim just said is go look at those kinds and see what their taxes are. I mean, we cannot offset the taxes to our taxpayers. We need to maintain uh, the impact fees. That, you know, development should pay their fair share. I think we need to relook at the commercial. The commercial is, is very high. Uh, for, for, uh, if anything is going to deter it, the commercial is going to deter uh, companies coming in. Uh, we need to reevaluate that and make sure they're paying their fair share. Uh, and it's, it's important that, that we maintain impact fees for that, for that reason. We, we don't want to do away with them because then again, taxes will go up. And I just, you know, again, we need to look at the other counties and see what they're doing to offset the impact fees. 
I agree. We need to keep the impact fees because that is the method that's been put together as the best possible solution to make growth pay for itself, if there is such a way to put it. So growth not only has to pay for itself, but if it doesn't, then you're going to be taxed. It's that simple. There's only two things that you can do if you do away with impact fees. You're going to have to tax the people, or you're going to have to do away with less services. And I don't think any of us want to do away with either one of those methods. So impact fees, pay as you go, and you use it or you lose it. Candidates. Uh, another question from the floor. Now, feel free if you want to ask a question to the individual candidate. That's okay. I would like to know what you would specifically do. What methods would you specifically use to protect the Indian River Lagoon? I believe that the lagoon as well as the beaches are a big asset and what we have to do is we have to be ever diligent about polluting the lagoon and the city of Vero Beach just recently passed where they, they're doing away with the sand cutting pollutants and I'm, I'm sure that this whole area of polluting our lagoon needs to be looked at and I'm not so sure it doesn't need to be looked at from just like they did with get away with DDT for mosquitoes. We're going to have to do away with some of these chemicals that are being used to make your lawns pretty. We need to protect the lagoon in every way possible. Just as the beach is the, the, galoon, the lagoon, excuse me, <laughs> lagoon is, our, is one of our greatest assets also. I mean, besides bringing tourism and, and the estuaries, I don't think people realize what, what in river a lagoon does for this community and for the Treasure Coast. Uh, it provides jobs, uh, it provides taxes. If you look at the real estate along the river, it's over $900 million in taxes of property that's on the river. So if the river goes away, where does the property value go? Uh, besides the, the amount of uh, wildlife and birds and fish that are there, it's, it's important to protect it. We need to make sure that we, we have proper procedures in place to take care of the water that's going into the lagoon. and. Uh, also, maybe look at other methods to uh, keep water from getting into the lagoon. Maybe you know those issues that they're talking out south of, of the county or west of the county, as far as maybe uh, stormwater banking or water harvesting. Thank you. Yes, I can remember uh, going shrimping off the Wabasso Bridge when we were kids with my dad on the old wooden Wabasso Bridge with the hand crank turnstile in the middle, and the shrimp and the fish that you could put your lantern down and see at night. And if you go there now at night, there's nothing there. It's gone. There's muck on the bottom. If you're water skiing and you drop off, you step on the bottom, it feels like goo. So we have a lot of contributing factors that are bringing sediment into the river basin, and we have to look at how can we capture those before they get into the river. And um, one thing that I, I have been told by a coastal engineer that it's a great idea, and if he had an unlimited budget, he could figure out how to build it. But if you remember, the Bethel Creek area had a natural man a natural inlet made by nature during one of the hurricanes and it acted as a great flushing system of the estuary being between the two inlets where that water is stagnant it goes up it goes down but it doesn't move is how do we get some good salt water intrusion like the Bethel Creek used to bring into that area many many years ago uh, it nature put it there for some reason and it's been closed up thank you Tim stole my thunder Quickly, um, uh, Socrates notwithstanding, we should have a, a, a fertilizer ordinance. They have it in the River Shores. They have it in Sebastian. It's silly. Um, and now, and now the big what I've been calling my pipe dream. I mean, we go back a hundred. If you go back a hundred years in this county, it's obvious we gotta get some flushing going on through Bethel Creek. If uh, you're the latest, latest way I've been talking about it, and I know I'm going to run over for a second, but if you look at look from the aerial, it's like it's like a dying heart, and we need to put a stint in. There's just a blockage. It's very very close. I mean, all we got to do is run a pipe. What is is it impossible? No, go 20 miles down the waterway. It's the exact same pipe mechanism that uh, that cools the um, St. Lucie nuclear power plant. Also, I'm going to mention this, this to you, I don't expect you to remember. East Harbor, Massachusetts. It's out on the, there's a place called Pilgrim Lake. It's out on the end of Cape Cod. Same scenario, dying lagoon. What, 
delicious water just a short time away. Ran a pipe, place came roaring back. I don't want to save the river, I want to improve the river. When Henry Flagler built his uh, railroad, he built it on the Florida Ridge. The water that fell on the other side of the ridge stayed on the other side of the ridge and we've constructed a series of canals that essentially have drained the swamp and they've drained the swamp into the lagoon and it hasn't been pretty since. We need to rethink how much we want to really drain into that lagoon. If, uh, if Nick's suggestion, Tim's suggestion, is at all possible, um, maybe, we, maybe we should invite the uh, um, Army Corps of Engineers, if, if that's possible, think of, the, think of the possibilities of what that river would look like um, in, the, in the Bureau Beach area, in the Bethel Creek area, if we could flush that. And if that's possible, that's something that, uh, that I think we really could look at and, and could go a long way to at least offsetting the drainage that we have going into the river. I'm proud to say that the county is the only governmental unit, unit in Indian River County to actually do something to remove nitrogen and phosphorus from the waters before or after they've gotten to the lagoon. We have the Egret Marsh Project, the Spoonville Marsh, the series screening device, and we're in the business of permitting another algal turf scrubber. These projects take nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water. But for the long-term solution, look on the back of the campaign card. It's one, all you need is one line plan to reverse the flow of the relief canals. This is a project that should and must be done in this community. We send the water to the west, probably around the St. John's Improvement District, set up a series of reservoirs, and at the end of the day, we've taken care of the nitrogen phosphorus pollution problem. We have made sure that we have an alternate water source for the future generations of Indian River County. We've taken care of our BMAP total maximum daily loads problem for the future, and we can stop setting up these little quarter acre stormwater pieces next to properties, utilize those properties fully, and send the water to the west. Thank you. Last question, then we'll go to a wrap up. Sure. John. Thank you all for coming. Um, as some of you know, some of you know, my family owns Jones Produce Market. And agriculture is very important to my family and mine. How do you feel about expanding the urban service area a mile west? How that affects the farms and groves out there? Um, I want to serve on this commission for a long time. Right now, I don't see any reason to move the urban service line. I think there's plenty of infill, plenty of work to be done in there. Um, eventually, someday. Do we look at it in 2025, you know, in 2020, uh, if the economy uh, permits, I think it's something we should look at. But uh, presently, no interest in building the urban service line. I have no particular interest in moving the urban service line. I have no interest in moving the urban service line because there's no need right now. But more importantly, I'm very pro-agriculture. I've worked in agriculture for 24 years. I understand the importance of agriculture in our community. And recently, when a group wanted to change some of the criteria out in the urban service buffer, which may have benefited ranchettes, which I see as a great danger to agriculture, I stopped that from happening, or helped stop that from happening. And I believe that we need to leave all the agriculture area out there for agriculture and not do things to invite more five-acre ranchettes out there, which will simply put the wrong type of pressure on the agricultural community. Thank you. As you can see by my campaign trail shirt, my husband over here wearing an orange shirt, I believe in citrus, which is part of agriculture. This is an agricultural county, believe it or not, between the citrus and the cattle. We need to protect that in the sense that we already have a wonderful comprehensive plan in place. We don't need to move the service area pushing out into ag. We need to maintain ourselves the way we are, and thankfully, if business picks up, we'll be able to do some of that infill and leave the egg the way it is. I agree with everyone. There's, there's no need to move the urban service line. There's enough room for infill, uh, enough for growth to, uh, to move into, and uh, I think we have regulations in place to, to uh, maintain that. Thank you. 
there's there's additional abundant capacity inside the urban service area. What I'd like the county to, to think about is to plan ahead and devise a formula of when it is truly justified and needed to move it. Not an emotional decision of red shirts showing up and blue shirts showing up at different meetings protesting something is is have a a long-term workshop event similar to the growth management one we had a few years ago when the pending moratorium issue was up. Um, decide what's the needs, what the factors are, what needs to be taken into consideration, and when X meets a certain point, then it may make sense to move it. But until then, and take the emotions out of it. I mean, emotions are important, but not, to me, it's black and white. Is there a need, yes or no? If there's not, define the future need, and then devise a plan of when it might be needed. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. That was a great form. Um, that will adjourn our meeting. We have another meeting on July 11th, and as I mentioned before, that will be Daryl Lohr will be half of the show, and that you know, will be the other. So again, uh, I think a round of warm of uh, welcome and, and applause to the candidates. Thank you.